what a rather wonderful moment to come together uh, from very different places this time. Um, strangely enough, I'm on the road in Vancouver. Jeff is in Erie. Mara, I assume, is in Brattleboro. And Carolyn is the only one in Boston for this particular gathering. I want to begin with a quote of Brother Thomas's and then uh, revise it. He said many years ago in, in the writings to us that love is real, the rest is not. And I would revise it in the context of our relationship with Jeff, especially that friendship is real and the rest is not. The opportunity to have come to know Jeff through Brother Thomas um, and the way that they met in such a um, wonderful way at uh, Mount St. Benedict in Erie, Pennsylvania, further reinforces the fact that when we discover friendship and it becomes part of our lives, our lives are transformed. And certainly, I think, certainly for Jeff, for us, the relationship with Brother Thomas was transformative on an ongoing basis. It wasn't a single event, but it was a continuing experience. And as I wrote to Jeff before this gathering today, um, I'm hoping that Thomas is with us. And Jeff said he certainly is. So the notion of being able to share an affection for, a love of, an understanding of that which makes the world better, namely Thomas's quote, consciousness of the beautiful will save the world, is one of the major attractions for us to Jeff and his art. There is such an extraordinary uh, reassuring presence and energy in each of the paintings that we felt. And when we shared it with the artist Samuel Bach, Sam's comment was, this is some of the finest painting that I've seen and freshest painting in the last 30 years. Hence, we are about to open an exhibition of Jeff's recent paintings at the gallery and to share them with many of you, we hope, both through the catalog, through this webinar, um, and hopefully those of you who are able will visit the gallery. Today, we have both Jeff, the artist, with us, and he will certainly reveal aspects of his own journey. And Mara Williams, who has been part of a few of these conversations and has enriched them enormously, first by her friendship with and knowledge of Mallory Lake's work, recently with the work of Gunnar Norman, who will be referenced in today's presentation. So I want to begin, I think, with looking at Jeff and what Jeff does and how he approaches his own work um, and how that work then, Mara, communicates to all of us. So Jeff, welcome. Thank you. Let's look at the first slide, which is painting how I do it. So Jeff, speak a little bit about why you do what you do, how you do what you do. And you have to keep in mind that we do have about 55 minutes for you to talk. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I'll try not to abuse that timeline. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, I'd say painting has been an important part of my life ever since uh, my adolescent years. Uh, it's been a constant sort of, um, it's been a constant. It's been a point of reference. It's uh, been a refuge. It's been a stimulus. It's been an inspiration. And it's been impacted by many things. And uh, over the years, it's been strengthened. And where it's been most strengthened is from sources I, that I would have never anticipated or imagined. Uh, for example, I, I, I was a general and trauma surgeon. And uh, much of what guides my sense of things when I paint now are things I learned in the operating room, not in a studio or the canvas, in terms of focus uh, on the subject matter, uh, patience with the subject matter, trying to understand what is the subject really trying to reveal, it, but always sort of keeping the big picture right. Another important influence was, you've already referenced, was Thomas, uh, who gave me the necessary reassurance that the, if the spiritual backdrop is right, all the other things will follow in due course. So it's... Uh, been there recently i've uh, had the pleasure to have more time for painting itself particularly during the pandemic uh which for me actually 
in many ways made it easier to focus on painting because I was outside much more often than before the pandemic commenced uh, in early 2020. Mara, do you have any thoughts about other surgeons who were painters? Um, and in what ways does being a physician uh, influence one's ability to both observe, listen, and then transfer that into action? Well, uh, yeah, I certainly, I can't think of anyone I know who's a physician, who's a painter, but I know musicians, uh, quite, a lot. quite a lot of musicians um, and a few sculptors, uh, you know, so painters, I, I don't personally, I, I can imagine there are. I think it's that power of observation. Um, to be a really you know, accomplished artist and to be a really accomplished physician, um, you, have to, you have to be curious, but be in deep sympathy mm -hmm. with what you're studying. Um, you're just, you know, so, if it, so you, you happen to be studying nature, which of course is living and organic in its own right, as opposed to somebody who might be interested in, in um, you know, doing portraits of buildings or, you know, Edward Hopper kind of work. Um, so, but, but I think that, that one of the things that, that doctors are trained to do is to look. You look at the color of someone's skin. So before you go to the tests, what you're doing is observing whether the, the, my mother used to do that. My mother was a biologist. She used to do this to me when I got cranky to make sure I wasn't anemic. Mom would touch her lips to our foreheads to see if we had a fever. Um, but that power of observation when someone comes in, a neurologist may notice a hitch in your gait that's a precursor or an early sign of Parkinson's, for instance. Um, you're a surgeon. You have to go in there and sort all those color reds and pinks out <laughs> of all the stuff that's in there. You know, that I only did it in biology <laughs> class in high school. And I, that was a little much for me. So that, that much observation I didn't want to do. Um, and... <laughs> So I think that power of observation and the kind of tools that you bring to it, you, you showed us a little handy dandy viewfinder that looks like an empty slide. Put it up so people can see it. Um, you know, you're out there observing, here, here you go. What, you know, even at three inches long, um, you know, so this is like a three by five card and you've got a one and a half to two and a half inch thumbnail sketch, true thumbnail. <laughs> Um, what are you observing about silhouette and mass? And, and when you capture that, what about it has the proportional balance and weight that sits right in you, that Seriously. gives you a pose and gives you a dynamic at the same time? Sorry. So, you know, I mean, I think that's why you know, someone who is a surgeon or a doctor um, becomes a good observer of nature and color, balance and design and all of those. Okay. I like it. One of the things that occurred to me when you said observation that surgeons or doctors bring to what they do, I would also hope that there is something called empathy mm. that, <laughs> that enables them somehow to be present for the individual for the situation that they're involved with, and then act upon that. And my sense, Jeff, is that the pieces that you have created are both keenly observed, but also empathetic. That somehow you have reached a way of communicating what you have experienced to us as a result of your ability to really integrate it into who you are. I'd say that's very true. Uh, many of the, most of the subjects I have are areas or it's subject matter with which I'm deeply familiar over time and over many years, uh, where to me, they're, they're really like, lit, the, especially the trees, particular trees, they're like living presences, they're entities, they're, they're not just a tree. Uh, you know, I remember how they, how they look through all the seasons and over time and aware of when they become ill and in sad cases, you know, when they're struck by lightning or they're cut down, uh, 
they're they're very emblematic of people, at least in my my own personal iconography. So Jeff, tell us about your you, you seem to go to a, you know a particular you know woodland. And, and you know, and I know you have deep, deep, deep family connections to a sense of place, you know, that mm -hmm. I feel like, like coming up through your feet is some sort of vibration or set of roots that's you as a person. And then you keenly observe um, and have this incredible reciprocity with the land you're walking. And why is that? Well, I, I think uh, part of it was just upbringing. It was... Uh, I was raised with a profound respect for nature uh, by both parents, um, both who were artists, one an extremely capable artist, my mother, who was the one who actually inaugurated me into <laughs> sort of revealed the mysteries of oil painting uh, as a way of sort of getting me on track back in school when I was you know, a rebellious child. Uh, but my father also was the one who you know, he kind of literally grew up in the wild. He was a Boy Scout and um, was very at home in nature and had profound respect for nature that was reinforced with his avocation, which was gardening. And, and really, he was a real botanist. He, he appreciated plants. He studied them. And one of the things I noticed that uh, or believe was that his experience with nature, particularly in the garden, really reinforced and informed his therapeutic philosophy as a physician and surgeon. And it's, it's had that same impact on me, though I've come by uh, those pastimes somewhat belatedly compared to my father. But the uh, respect for living things in all their developmental stages and uh, balancing uh, some degree of guidance and control with allowing nature to do its thing, which it knows best, is, is a extremely worthwhile principle in guiding people to health or even in the conduct of an operation as well as the conduct of a painting. To not, you know, don't overtake your subject. Um, don't, don't control it too much. Uh, let it speak for itself as much as you can and get out of the way when it is speaking. Well, I think you do that very successfully. What I love about your work is how deft the touch is. Um, so for instance, if you were to focus in, I can't do a pointer. This, this is one of the reasons why I love being in front of paintings with an audience. <laughs> um, but if you go to what is on my screen, the right side of this, this great red oak, and you look at how, yeah, that's exactly it. Layering happened between the tree and the sky and the infill of that blue paint. It is not overworked. It is, it is um, it's got both energy and a, what my father might say was a delicate sufficiency of touch. <laughs> mm. um, and, and it just, it, it's not overworked. It's not over. You 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 put down that paint and then you backed away. Mm -hmm. That has a lot of finesse, and I like a lot of finesse. It's just me. No, I, I love that. And this particular piece, there's a element in the lower sort of center of it where there's some white brushstrokes, just touches mm -hmm. that create a certain energy to it that has to have happened intentionally and accidentally at the same time. And what you said about being sort of rooted in and letting the experience of being where he is literally flow through him and then onto the canvas is exactly the feeling that so many of these pieces bring. One of the issues that I raised earlier when we were talking before we started was the last webinar we did about the work of Gunnar Norman who also worked out of doors, was inspired by nature in an incredible <laughs> way. And so what I've asked is to show just a brief clip from the last webinar and then to integrate it into our conversation about how Jeff works, the contrast between black and white and color. Uh, so we're good. Thanks.
So Jeff, you're welcome to talk over if you'd like about this process. Not in Swedish, though. <laughs> well, it's uh, it's uh, certainly deja, deja vu for me uh, when I see that. I mean, it's all these paintings begin, they all begin with a thumbnail sketch, pretty much the same size as what he's doing there, maybe even smaller than that. Uh, uh, but they're critically important because if your fundamental design isn't right, you will never recover it. Just as if your fundamental plan for a procedure is flawed, you know, you're going to have a devil of a time making it right. right. Um, so it, it probably, there's probably some degree of instinct involved. Certainly the, the viewfinder helps with practice. You know, I carry it with me everywhere and uh, look everywhere again and again. Um, but the finish, the, I've seen the initial sketches, the, the small thumbnail sketches, you know, when, when matted and framed, they're, they're, to me, they're just as appealing as any finished piece. And just I as love important. it too. So now, if you could, Amar, just talk a bit about how color both informs our experience of nature and how black and white can as well, particularly with these two artists as a, an example. Well, you know, I, I, what I always think is interesting, if, if you are really, if you're really thinking about form and structure, black and white works to your advantage. And then if you're really thinking about color um, and texture and mass and, and surface, color works to your advantage. <laughs> um, and so, so successfully balancing between those two things, as, as Jeffrey's quite right in pointing out, if the underlying structure that was derived from a thumbnail sketch isn't right on a canvas, you can't recover from that mistake. You just can't. Um, but but in, in this, when the, the, there's a lot of linear structure in the background here, which anchors this, this mass of pulsing um, energy that are the tree branches and the light dancing off the tree branches and the positive and the negative space behind behind these tree branches. So there's more of a dance in a work that is employing color than there is in um, one using using uh, black and white. I think we have a black and white where the linear structure and the delicacy here really really draws you into um, line. Mm. Um, it draws you into pattern um, in, in, a, in a way that um, you know, attenuates the line and downplays the incident of branches. They're there, they certainly are recognizable as trees, um, but, but what's here is just this overwhelming vertical structure where you know that you're looking up into tall Norwegian pines because the vertical starts it, but it's the sort of pulse forward of the branches that you're caught in. Interesting point. Um, I don't have any black pigment oil paint. I never use black in my painting. Um, Part of that was just from early training when it, it was just not part of the palette I was first trained with. And part of it became more philosophical. Like I just don't believe in absence of color, no matter how subtle. For these really dark tones, it's, it's usually uh, a combination of phthalo green and the lizarin or, you know, ultramarine blue and maybe a little bit of uh, cad red. Uh, those are the things I use to, to get these really dark notes that look like black, but they're, they're not black. They're not, it's not ivory black or lamp black. I love the notion of the contrast between those two approaches. And yet the experience of both your work and Gunnar's work are somewhat similar to me, meaning that there is a, a sense of being present which I think we called the title of the show, In Pursuit of Poetry. The notion that both of you have enabled us 
to engage with nature as if it is poetry. You've taken your abilities, your talent, and then enriched our lives in such a profound way. And it's such a joy to somehow have made this schedule in such a weird way that um, you're both here. Um, and part of the gallery and part of the experience for anyone who accesses it. So just as a sort of midway, thank you, uh, Jeff, for doing what you do and bless Gwenner's memory for having done all that he did um, in a wonderful manner so that we can continue our conversation with you at work in the next image. There you are. <laughs> Talk about your sense of um, exploration of the world. And eventually I do want to get back to your um, training as well as a physician and at least how that aspect of who you are um, makes the paintings even more wonderful. Um, this image is from Presque Isle State Park. Uh, I'm very much at risk of getting a tick bite <laughs> in this heavily right. infested area. Uh, it was a stormy uh, northeaster type day. Wind out of the east is always bad in Erie County. And uh, the um, trees, the, the everything was sort of beginning to shake violently. And the, the, the colors were sort of a sickly, ghostly, uh, muted, very much of a grayscale. I started... Uh, very spontaneously, something caught my eye, went to, to do that. And um, a passerby who likes to photograph the nature photography stopped, took this picture, started a conversation, and eventually sent me the image. And that that's a pretty frequent occurrence out at Presque Isle. There are a lot of people taking, there are not many, there are, there are one or two other painters, but uh, a lot of photographers. <laughs> I'm going to jump in as a New Englander to say you're definitely a mid-Atlantic person, but if most of our audience are Bostonians, when you say Presque Isle, we all think Maine. <laughs> right. It's up in Erie County that might have given people like, a, a, we don't have an Erie <laughs> County up there, but, um, but we have Presque Isle, Maine, but this is a, a state park in the north it's a west corner of Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, just for people who haven't landed in the right place. Yeah, it's a beautiful frond of land coming from the main land, reaching out into Lake Erie. Nice. Um, what I love about this photograph, which is not so much about your your art, but I feel like, you know, the, the mirror in art history is always important. And then um, again, when you have the um, the surrealist, the picture of the picture within the picture of the picture, mm -hmm. and just how completely your canvas catches the tone of the surrounding landscape. It's got it's got one of those like the hidden doll within the doll, mirror within the mirror of infinity quality to it. So I really do love this photograph. Well, key technical point is uh, I never paint in a place where I can't back up, standing up. Uh, for me, a, a major evolutionary jump, just like uh, creatures crawling on land from the sea, was when I stopped using a folding stool to sit and paint, where I didn't have the ability to, to take, you know, several paces back and look. And uh, that was a major corrective for a lot of work to be able to do that, to be sure exactly what you pointed out happens, that it is harmonious and it is consistent with the surroundings. And the next slide, you're also at work, if I'm not mistaken. That was in the days when I sat on my butt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, this is also Presque Isle. Uh, this was in the very uh, earliest days of me getting, I, I converted, I used to paint in acrylic and um, a very dear friend who's a painter also uh, persuaded me to use oil or go back to oil, which I had done long ago. And I finally did. And I wish I had done it sooner because it, it's a very different experience because of its plasticity. You can push it around. I like the smell of turpentine and linseed and Yum. 
the tradition that goes with it. It's just, I just thought there was no substitute for it. No, now I don't do any acrylic painting. Are you going to say something about uh, acrylic or oil or just um, let you well, the hook? You, you really can push it around more and a lot longer. Right. Um, you know, you can continue to blend um, if that's your, your preference. Um, um, you know, there's something more forgiving about oil than any other medium that you're going to use as a painter. And this is a lovely juxtaposition, um, it seems to me. So, Mar, do you want to chair, chat just a bit about it? And then we well, can. This is just another in. example of, of, of how fresh this work is. You know, here you are working in oils, which you can labor over. I mean, you really can labor over oil, and you don't which is so astounding. These, these canvases, I'm, I'm sure there are multiple layers of buildup, but you never get fussy in that way. So there's just, you know, for me, it's that the touch of an artist is where energy is communicated. Uh, so it's, yes, there's that all, all over picture, but when you sort of noodle around in it as a viewer going from place to place to place to place, um, your your touch is just so dramatically fresh to me, and I, I think that's just you know it must be <coughs> you are a surgeon and you know doing the kind of work that you do the kind of finesse you need to suture in the middle of a pool of blood or something you just you must have to have the most delicate touch ever, and that really does translate to um, your touch on these canvases where. The gesture may in fact be bold, but the touch just, it, the paint glances the surface and is laid down and then you're back away from it. And it's just so right in almost every touch of across a canvas. I love it. I just love it. I, I, I love also the, the imagery of the suturing in the, in the pool of blood, but I must say that I would also add to that that Jeff has a, um, well, there's a phrase in Yiddish called spilkas, which has to do with the kind of, um, I call them having Mexican jumping beans in your shorts. Um, <laughs> this kind of energy that keeps him hopping, I guess is the word. And that I think plays into what you were saying, which is that there is a benefit from having that kind of energy and not overdoing it, not over painting it. And then going back to it again and again. And all you do ultimately is diminish it. We, we years ago, years and years, meaning 60 years ago, dealt with an artist in Israel whose really best paintings were done quickly and then leave them alone. Those when he decided he wanted to be an artist and he spent <laughs> weeks working on the painting were disastrous. So knowing who you are and what your strength is certainly uh, benefits these paintings in a, in a very, very positive way. This is a wonderful juxtaposition, Jeff. If you want to speak about it, I'd love to hear you. Something has always captivated me about where uh, the sky and the land meet, whether it's a horizon, but particularly in uh, lakes, ponds, even puddles, uh, the, the reflection, the presence of the sky and the land is something that I've always been drawn to. I'm also drawn to the sentiment of the plowing the early spring plowing you know the the promise of the heart the summer and the, the harvest to come in the fall you know knowing how this patch of ground will uh, transform itself over the coming months so all these things together at this site that i drive by almost every day was it was it had already taken place and was already prepared in my mind i think before i even stepped out and did the first thumbnail sketch of it to to continue on the discussion about you know the maintaining the light touch and the spontaneity of it's often asked about you know what what makes a great surgeon and uh in terms of the operating and it's not the fastest uh which is a really clumsy characterization of what what good surgery would be and inaccurate good surgeon the best surgeons are the ones who made the fewest moves possible uh with a maximum amount of benefit 
I noticed in my training that the, the, the really master surgeons, they never seem to be going too quickly, uh, but they always accomplish what they did in a timely fat times is zip by. And that's because everything they did had a purpose. There were no repetitive or wasted moves. And all of those principles, for me at least, translated completely into the approach to painting. You make every move count and with as few moves as possible. Well, I think that is exactly why these paintings are so successful. I, I mean, it just is, um, it's masterful, um, both in its observational skill and its touch. What I'd like to point out about this particular piece, you know, the title of the show is Pursuit of Poetry. And poetry, again, is that economy of beans, that distillation using the fewest words possible to evoke. Um, and so this is very visually evocative and poetry can be, you know, they use words to evoke and they use rhythm structures to evoke. But one of the things that is, that language can do and what paintings can do is evoke other senses. When I look at this work and I know spring and mm -hmm. I know that tactile quality, I can actually smell the earth here. And that's I exactly that, what I would have wanted that to do, because that that's what I that was I was going to say too bad there isn't a way you can appreciate the sound and the smells in all of these paintings. Well, I think you can do that here. It's it's just like if somebody successfully kept, captures a salt marsh for me, I know exactly what it is going to smell like. Um, and and the pines around a freshwater lake smell a certain way that they don't smell anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And I can look at these pieces and I can really get that olfactory moment going. Um, it's, it's just like when you, when you don't have to touch a painting to know the velvet feeling on your skin. Uh, I think that's a wonderful way of thinking about how the totality of all your senses in understanding poetry. It has a lot to do with, Jeff, it seems to me, you're having done this over and over again so that it becomes, in a sense, a response mechanism that is built into you and therefore not, and I don't mean it in a good or bad way, not consciously done, but growing out of who you are, who you have become and who you will be at the moment. And then if that communicates to others through all the other technical aspects of it, then you've done a very successful surgery and we have a good painting. So let's look at this next combination of uh, both the setup and the painting. <laughs> Jeff, where were you? Both of these are at, again at Presque Isle, one on a nice brisk January morning. Uh, as you can see, when I started this, uh, the sky was a little clear. And by the time I took this picture, <laughs> you know, the, the bane of plein air painter's existence is, you know, wind. Uh, that's your real enemy. Not even rain is a problem. Wind is your enemy. It blows your parasol. It, your canvas becomes a spinnaker. <laughs> 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 and the, the light changes so... Uh, like in like in an operation, you really you can't fool. You need to move along, and because time is is always precious. So that's just a thought on that. Um, and I also want to look at the, the next piece that we're going to look at. But go ahead, you finish this one, and then I want to. No, look at the next. these are just different times. The other one is uh, an area, and this there there's kind of a sadness in this painting on the right of the trees because this is not fall. This is the result of rising water level, killing off a lot of these beautiful deciduous trees, mostly oak trees. And it, it really caught my attention because this was like July when I did this was this is not this is not an early fall picture. So I my my sense was catch this to sort of record it and because of his aesthetic interest, but also maybe, you know, is a is, is a point of reference to see what happens over time. But it's also, if art does in fact deal with life, 
and teach us something, then you're teaching us something that life has a beginning, middle, and an end. And that even though you may be painting a snow scene or a landscape in a particular way, it's also a recognition of the fragility and ephemeral quality yeah. of our existence. And when art can get to that point and keep us somehow aware of um, our impermanence, uh, then I think it really is, does what it needs to do, which is it enables us and humbles us to live in a world with gratitude. Jeff, and then this one in the, in the ensuing painting that's shown, I think are really quite wonderful and shows you as a man for all seasons. There it is. You want to talk about the painting, Jeff, and then the fact yes. that you were permission to do an enlargement of it. Yes. Um, this is a, for me, this has a, a very uh, primal sort of appeal and attraction. This is a stream that courses through uh, our, my father's property, it, it was, he named it after uh, a castle in Scotland that he had visited where reportedly or supposedly uh, we were descendants of the, of the clan that had occupied it. Um, he named this property that he acquired in 1955, a beautiful country place that's on the shore of Lake Erie. And coursing it through is a stream that's been there ever since I can remember. I remember catching crayfish and small turtles there when I was, you know, six, seven years old. But to me, it's always been a reminder of the, the source of water, the source of life. And I, I was always struck by the beauty of it, the deep black or dark green, deep olive and eggplant color of the water cutting through the snow in the early spring. It was always such a refreshing contrast. I remember in Massachusetts, rowing on the Nashua River of all places in March and having that same delight and seeing this very dark water contrasted by these gorgeous snow banks along the river. So that, that was kind of the attraction and the appeal. And this was painting that was done on location at that site is a reminder of the, just the importance of water in the, uh, the freshness of it, the you know the eternal spring and our source of our strength in our life. Mara, well, I, I, I think you're back to your poetry there in terms of the source of, of life. What I'm really you know just marveling at is um, in the in the two thirds up the stream is that you've captured the light through the canopy. Even on, even, I mean, it must be spectacular in person, um, but right right at the halfway point and then down in the, in the painting, but, but two thirds up in the stream, I can see the light from the canopy, the blue from the background in this beautiful passage of painting that is largely hidden, but fully present. Mm -hmm. Jeff, then this led, I think, to your creating a much larger version of it. And what were some of the challenges that you had to deal with? Because this is sort of a uh, plein air on steroids. And you had to work <laughs> at, a, at, a, at a larger scale. And how did you find your, how, what were the challenges involved in that for you? Well, first, first of all, um, what was as the uh, increasing the scale, typically the plein air paintings are eight by 10 or nine by 12, sometimes larger. And sometimes that's where it all ends. Other times uh, those works come into the studio where I would characterize it as they are maturing or growing or curing and they become larger works, sometimes more abstract. Uh, I do take photographs for reference to go back if, if I want to put in some detail that I, I may not have captured in the original study or that when I think it's appropriate. Uh, in this case, what was asked for, the, uh, the spectrum of color of the setting was 
very different. Uh, wasn't right for this. So it was something that, you know, I, I was going to do, have to do, the subject would be the same, but the hue, the chroma would be something very different. And at first I was wondering if I could do it. And luckily I was able to do it. And actually by enlarging it and being forced to find a new solution, the work actually I thought was even better than if I just simply replicated this one on a larger scale. But that, that whole dilemma we're always in and uh, that Tom yeah. has taught me, <laughs> which is you welcome and embrace uncertainty because that's the only thing that will really reveal what your creative ability is. That goes back to his quote that risking and dreaming are primary acts of creativity. <clears throat> the yeah. willingness to risk um, and to dream enables us to sometimes grow, but the finished large enlargement of this is really quite beautiful as well. Can we look at the next slide, please? So this has been hanging in my office waiting for you to come to Boston to sign, but otherwise you're <laughs> welcome to speak about it because I assume you made it. Yeah, that's legit. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those glorious uh, late that's October okay. days. Uh, on Dunstaff, it's the same place. It's this is maybe 500 feet from where that stream is. Uh, end of the day, uh, going out in a blaze of glory, this clump of oak trees, catching you know the last of the sun. Uh, there is kind of an iconography of death in a lot of my paintings, and it's not always horrible. Sometimes it's very glorious. Uh, but there, there is a sort of re repeated pattern of imagery. The hemlocks, the pines are important symbols of that for me because not so much their mortality, but because of their immortality. Mara, I'd like you to speak about it. And then I want to go back to that issue, Jeff, that in fact, art does deal with both life and death. Well, all I can think of this one is firebird and, and, and dance and you know, just it, it, these trees seem to be dancing and, and seem to be reveling in their own beauty and their, that kind of passion the last the last hurrah of the season if it were but there just is something so um, dancerly about this piece you know just the way it, it sort of explodes across the canvas so the kind of movement that is captured and the the, the principal you know, dancer right there in the center stage. <laughs> That's quite wonderful. I also love the negative spaces of the sky coming through. And it's kind of a nature's lace, if you will, mm -hmm. so that it creates this uh, back and forth of um, focus for me. But Jeff, it seems to me that when you talk about and dealing with the seasons and particularly autumn as the end of a time, it's also part of a cycle. And right. that in the Western world, we take that much more seriously and have elaborate funerals and caskets and a variety of things. But in the East, it really is a kind of continuity of life and death being joined and the consciousness of both, at least while we're conscious, um, is critical to, I think, the notion of appreciation and gratitude. Um, so when a painting can evoke some of those feelings and issues and ideas, I believe we're really fortunate. So thank you for that painting. I'm glad so, you have it. Yeah, it's, it's brought me great joy. And especially if it's signed one day. Meanwhile, let's go to the next piece, which takes us to the next season in a way, but really quite splendid. Well, here's uh, a piece of black, you know, <laughs> it's not black, but of line, be, of line being more important like we looked at Gunnar's work earlier yeah um you know on this one it's really about the rhythm structures of the line and and because you've taken the color down this beautiful nuanced to tonality in your snow and your reflected sky snow um but but the um the lattice of the tree and the trunk here is what comes to the fore um, and I think if it had a lot more color in it, you would lose, you would lose that. 
Jeff, this, you're entitled to a rebuttal. This is um, as you enter um, Presque Isle State Park. Um, this is a view of uh, Presque Isle Bay from from the park itself. As you enter, this is what you would see, and uh, it caught my eyes exactly because of the the linear design was so striking. But also uh, just the hints of life. This is February. That even then, because um, I spend a lot of time cross country skiing out on that bay when it when it's frozen over. And this is about the time, even when there's abundant snow and ice, you get first few hints of life of, of spring that's to come. And it's actually rather than a frozen wilderness, it's full of life. It's full of energy. And uh, there's that undercurrent of energy, even at this time of year, um, that I've come to appreciate because I've spent so much time out there. The foreground network of design of the trees, of the snow-covered trees in the foreground, and then the calm of the water itself and the simplicity of the mountains or hills in the background creates such a wonderful sense of transition from the foreground, middle ground, and background and a sense of space all in a very, very small canvas again, but again, extremely, extremely lively and fresh. Next piece, please. So Jeff, do you wanna speak about these two actually? Yeah, so we this, is, this is a photo. I love vineyards. Um, I love them as a symbol of civilization. I like, I enjoy wine. Right. <laughs> I, I enjoy history. Uh, there, there's vineyards of always yeah, captured. And here, throughout all the seasons of the, the changing color and design of it, it, it really is delightful. We have a very, we have many vineyards in Erie County. It, it is the center of the Concord grape industry. Yeah. Gradually, this is now more and more. Uh, wine varietals are being grown here but all about here it's glorious in the fall where you get golds oranges and reds and it's beautiful in the spring when the when the vines are very fresh and then when they're really full in the summer so it's it's one of those subjects that i would always come back to this was a quick plein air study of a, a vineyard um east here of erie uh, which I thought had the potential to be mature to much larger and uh, works, which I think you, yes. Yeah. And like so many things, you know, the accidental, the unexpected was, is often carries the day or makes the painting. I was just doing the first pass of blocking in the color. I ran out of paint. <laughs> and the underpainting, which is red oxide, which I picked because of its, it's, it's so evocative of earth color. It's a pigment that Native Americans were very familiar and were fond of using. And so there's that link to history and culture. But here was this area of reveal in the upper part of the painting. And uh, the more I looked, I said, I think that should stay there. I think if that wasn't there, this would be a much less interesting thing, a much less interesting creation. So I left it, and I'm glad I did. Absolutely. Mara? Well, you know, there's a history of unfinished paintings. <laughs> and um, what was it? The map, I think the map when they took over the Whitney's over in the Royal Building um, did, did a history of unfinished works. It was fabulous. And, and um, I, tend, I tend to like sketches and I tend to like works that just leave something undone or underdone um, because it invites you into a thought process and a working process. And it allows you to have you know, sort of agency to complete and to wonder. Uh, as a viewer, and but but in terms of that, just that whole um, line across the top of the vineyard um, where it's it's worked in, and then then the sky beyond is something else. Um, 
the line itself has so much energy and then it's almost as if the the real <laughs> you're very funny to say in a painting but but the real part of the painting and the painting part of the painting um like stand as two different things in the same space in a way that I think just creates remarkable energy. Jeff, I hope that your your head is not swelling too much based upon Mara's wonderful descriptions of each of your works, but they seem to be somewhat justified as we look at the emperor. Yeah. An old friend on Presque Isle is, is this towering uh, white pine. And uh, it it almost looked, it had a sense of, I sensed the sense of pride and command and majesty, especially when uh, Festoon and Garland with this fresh snow and this crisp sky, it was, it was impossible to pass this by and not, not react to it. The uh, pretty good, unfinished pretty good reaction. life is, you know, life is a canvas that's unfinished as well. I mean, a, a, a thought or a sentiment that I had had and been exposed to countless times. So there's there was some appeal of that. It just as Mara, Mara had outlined that uh, it does give agency to the viewer. It, allow, it allows the, the imagination to be just a little more free. But like the hardest part of plein air painting or any painting, the hardest thing I believe is knowing when to stop mm -hmm. it's knowing when you said just enough and and not indulging in overkill in some fashion well go ahead Marge because I have well, something to say about it that too emperor was another example of you placed us in a very particular position vis-a-vis -vis this tree. I happen to live in a place where I am surrounded by white pines. Um, my whole property is ringed by them. And when you're underneath them or close to the edge and, and you're torquing your neck up at this impossible angle, um, they smell a certain way. They imprint on you a certain way. They inspire a certain <laughs> way. And I am so right underneath a tree with that hmm. clear, 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 frosty, cold blue sky and the festooning of, of the limbs. Um, I also love that moment when the snow gets too heavy and it all plops right down to the ground. Mm -hmm. You're sort of at that moment. And any of us who go out and walk in nature or cross country ski or live in North country, um, like I can smell this very moment. And I love that in the painting. Jeff, what you sort of mentioned before is creating just enough, but not too much, relates not only to painting or to poetry or to writing, but it also, I think, relates very much to relationships. And so that if people can use the opportunity to view your work and understand that what each of the paintings, and we go to the next as well, invite us to do is to reflect not only on the place and the experience that you're sharing with us, but also the underlying um, direction emotionally and spiritually that I think very much informs virtually every painting of yours and certainly every correspondence that you and I have had and the relationship that you shared with Brother Thomas, that there is this moment of recognition about the spirit that informs the meaning of our existence by way of an introduction to the Golden Vineyard. Up to you, Jeff. The Golden Vineyard is, uh, is a, a painting of a life itself. This is late fall. Uh, the vineyard's already yielded its harvest. And it's kind of, in this case, it, it's looking back on life as it becomes smaller and smaller in the distance as you look back, but it's it's ultimately, it's crowned with gold. And in the back, in my own iconography, you see the, the horizon of the lake, which represents eternity. And the sky that's somewhat troubled close up, but uh, tends to smooth out as you go on. But I remember, I, I had this sense of 
bittersweetness as I look back upon it. The uh, but also great beauty, great beauty in its ephemeral nature and the fact that it's gone its full cycle. And in the spring, the cycle will return. Uh, that's a really interesting, um, you know, artist, you know, artist perspective to me, because the first thing I thought when I looked at this painting that what so I, it's both weighty and weightless at the same moment, both um, on a physical level, there's, it seems to be, it, it's, it's so dense in the foreground of the, the vineyard, but as you travel up the right edge, that lattice opening into deep space. Mm. Um, so you start with a weight and it moves to be almost like a honeycomb that doesn't exist, that, that is open and wonderful to something beyond. Um, and and you know, when I kept thinking about that actual sort of heft and feeling that is both weighty and weightless at the same moment. Um, and and your your in your interpretation of the piece and where you're looking out to in the piece and the moment in time that you're trying to describe in painting to us is that moment of transition that's both weighty and weightless um, that is life. And the word itself is often the word transition is used in certain communities as the transition to another life. And it's their description of death rather than using that word. <laughs> yes, but, but what's also interesting about that, Bernie, is I have an, enough friends who are OBGYNs and women go into transition and labor in that moment right before birth as well. So it, transition is, is, um, is quite evocative in many ways. Yeah, in many vocabularies. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the next couple of pieces. I want to apologize in advance that normally we run over a little bit. And we probably will do it today. So those of you that have an appointment, we'll see you later. We, this will be recorded and shared and available. So you'll get the benefit of the final couple of images. Jeff, this is an absolutely extraordinary piece as well. Well, it was, a, it was in memory and with thoughts of a very extraordinary individual who happened to be my father. Um, he was a can say not frivolously, but he was a mensch in war <laughs> and peace. Uh, his favorite place when he wasn't in the operating, when he wasn't, his favorite place was his garden, which I mentioned earlier. And near it was a barn and behind the barn was this very stately group of trees, including this maple, the, ma the dominant maple tree. And he used to stand out there and look into the ravine and look north which is where Lake Erie is in reference to this and uh, I often wondered what he was thinking about because he obviously was thinking about something because he was he was he had a very contemplative side and when he was gone I remember going back there myself and I think gee he's he's still here <laughs> he's still here <laughs> only this time it, it was it was the tree and not him and then I realized because of the fall season that this, this was very much, this was the way he was in his final years was one of preserved stature and uh, a t despite some tr troubles that he had and things that he had, he had a lot of processing to do because of what he had experienced in his life. Overall, it was a time of great beauty. Last well well captured in this. I just realized when I picked up the catalog that this was a piece we chose for the cover of the catalog for the exhibition, which we can mail to people if they don't already have it or it's available online and they can enjoy it that way. And now moving to the last piece, if we can, certainly not the last piece in the show, there are many more. Jeff, um, obviously a favorite location for you. This is uh, the view of Presque Isle Bay from behind my house. And frequently we have uh, cold fronts move through here. And there comes this moment when a front passes through where there's this very rapid striking transition from hot, 
sticky, stormy, unsettled weather to freshening of air in this beautiful, continuous, steady sound of the wind. And to me, the, it, it's, a, it's the very picture and the very sound of what transcendence is really, the, 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 the quality that unites life and death. And every time I, I hear that wind and I see this transition of light as these fronts pass through, I'm, I'm reminded of a, of a blessing from sacred script, scripture that begins with, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. And this is my visual understanding of what that is really all about. And I wish, I wish you could hear the sound as well, because it's the sound it's the sound of peace. It's the sound of transcendence. It's the sound of forgiveness and love. Mara? I was going to say, wow, you learned a lot from Brother Thomas. Right. <laughs> I don't think there's anything that should be added to that. That was simply beautiful. Agreed, although given the fact that I like to add the things, I will because I uh, quote from the Psalms 118 verse 24, which Jeff knows well, and is on the, my personal letterhead, which is, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us greet it with joy and gladness. And I think if nothing else, that quote summarizes these paintings, that it is an invitation to reflect on the quality of life, the spirit of life, and to provide us each with an invitation to greet these paintings and to greet life with joy and gladness. I'm grateful to both of you. I missed our rehearsal. Um, I'm awfully glad I made the real event. <laughs> you, you both bring such an extraordinary depth of visual understanding and are able to verbalize it so that listening to you the paintings take on an added beauty and added meaning that is not possible without you so thank you both for being with us thank you those of you who were able to join us and enjoy the art and the day thank you you're welcome um